And I think genuinely being around those people has helped me be more funny Mm -hmm. so that when it comes to like being on camera, I feel like I'm not out of place that much anymore. I feel like I'm actually providing something for the content. If I'm on a show like a no holds board, for example, when I'm surrounded by people and we're all playing a board game, I think I actually provide some sort of value. Whereas before when my imposter syndrome is quite bad, I would have thought that like, oh, we're here because we need Pete's here because we need to fill numbers. Whereas now it feels like we want Pete on the show because I think he's actually going to be good for it. What's going on, guys? It's your boy, Tom Tom Trash, and stand back with another big interview. This time, I'm joined by the one and only Pete Quinnell from Wrestle Talk and now the Pete Repeat. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's very good to be back. And uh, I th- I it's nice to see you all back on the show, actually. <laughs> yeah. It's been it's been wonderful to see your uh, your progress since last time. Uh, it's I been really very cool to see your your progression through YouTube and stuff. It's awesome. I really appreciate that, my good friend. So if we take this back, Pete, I know we talked about this a bit last time. But for people mm. that might not know, because we've grown a bit since we did our last interview, just a rough outline. How did you first discover wrestling? And then how did you join WrestleTalk for people that may not know? Sure. Uh, so the brief version uh, is uh, I used to watch wrestling when I was very young with my brothers. Um, I, have, I have two older brothers and they used to watch it and I used to be in the same room with them when I was young. So by default, I was watching it as well. Um, but then when they grew out of wrestling, I also grew out of wrestling because I just wanted to be as cool as them. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I, I got back into wrestling courtesy of my best mate at the time when I was around 17 ish, 16, 17 years old. Um, where he started telling me about certain things that were happening in WWE and like, uh, did you, have you heard about like, the, there's this new group called the Nexus. They're from this show called NXT and blah, 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 you know, all this stuff. And I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. And then, yeah, the first match I watched was uh, Team WWE versus Team Nexus from SummerSlam, which everybody knows is a terrible match and it sucks and everyone hates it. But for if me, having no from context. Our, from yeah. our last chat. It was, yeah. uh, if I remember correctly, it was you sort of was taken in by the hype of the video package, if I remember correctly. That is absolutely right. Yeah, it was because I had no context of the previous years of Cena being on top. I had no context of the rest of the storyline. The only thing that I'd seen was the video package and the match. And that told an amazing story. So I was hooked and it was awesome. But yeah, everyone hates it except me. So out of interest... Just to flip the question then, Pete, what is a match that everyone loves that you're like, nah, this isn't for me? Ooh, 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 what is a match that everyone loves where I'm like, eh, um, you know, I can't think of one right now. Um, Should we move that to the generic question at the end of the show? I mean... I mean, I'll tell you what, um, one that comes to mind, one that's not like, it's not one that everybody loves, because I think people agree that this is probably the weakest in this, in their series of matches, and it's not, but I personally didn't get a lot out of the Adam Cole versus Johnny Gargano, like their three stages of hell, not three stages of hell, two out of three falls, weird steel cage thing at the end. I, yeah, like it was a weird match, that one. I just watched it, I was like... I mean, the wrestling's objectively good, but like, I'm just not not vibing with it. I'm not feeling it, you know. Um, so probably that one would be my call. It's very very cool, my friend. So mm. again, I know we talked about this during our last conversation, but since we've grown, and for the people that may not know, how did you join Wrestle Talk and things like that? Uh, so uh, join a Wrestle Talk. I initially started writing for WrestleTalk.com. Um, there was a, a call out in a Wrestle Talk news video, and I was just a fan of Wrestle Talk. Uh, so I saw them call out for writers for the website. I started writing for the website. Uh, as part of a random throwaway conversation uh, with another one of the website writers, I mentioned that I used to have my own YouTube channel back in the day because I did, and I ran my own channel just for fun because I had a hobby and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when it came to Wrestle Talk launching their second channel, which was about video games and movies, 
uh, I got a call and just be like, hey, you used to have a YouTube channel, right? And it was about video games. I was like, yeah, that, yep, that is what it was. So like, cool, do you want to send in some clips to, to Laurie and see if they want to come down and do a screen test, all that stuff? So did that and they seem to like me because I'm still here. Um, mm. So yeah, did the screen test, it was all good. And then I joined from then on. You talked about in an interview I watched for research, the fact that in your original YouTube channel, the gaming one, you didn't want to do to hire anyone to do the editing or the things like that. You really wanted to learn yourself to do those sort of things. So how did that help you with your work with WrestleTalk, being able to do editing, being able to do maybe thumbnail designs and things like that? Uh, it's helped uh, tremendously um, because <laughs> a, a lot of the things that I do, uh, not necessarily now, but definitely in previous years, uh, I was a bit of an all-round handyman, so it was uh, whatever, whenever anything needed doing. Like I had a bit of experience with graphic design, have a bit of experience with editing, had a bit of experience with streaming, and like using the software necessary for streaming and stuff like that. So anytime there was like something new that we wanted to do, I would be one of the people who would help out with that thing because I would be, I would never like be excellent at anything, but I'd be good at like everything. So mm. if they needed a helping hand for anything at all, I was the handyman that would come in and and give a helping hand. Uh, so it definitely really helped uh, having all that experience with editing because also now I'm working like hands on with editors to go through certain edits for, for certain shows and stuff like that for WrestleTalk. And mm. I'm providing feedback on those edits and me having experience with editing means I can give them better feedback rather than just like, I want this to feel different, but I don't know how I can like give them specific things to be like, actually, if you do like a fade here and then you introduce this thing here, then actually this might work a little bit better. So that gives me, allows me to be even more of a guiding hand than I would be otherwise. So yeah, it helps massively. We're jumping around a bit here, but I feel like since you talked about your own channel set, we'll go straight into Pete Repeat there. So where did the initial idea for that come? Where did the idea for like, if you read the description, essentially it's, my name's Pete. I, I make video essays about things I like and things I don't like. So yeah. how did the initial idea for that come about and things like that? Um, well, there's a certain YouTuber by the name of Super Eyepatch Wolf who does amazing video essays about loads of stuff, about anime and about video games and about wrestling as well. Uh, and uh, the guy who runs that, John, is a lovely man. And he is the biggest inspiration I think I've had on YouTube in maybe ever. Um, I get such a kick out of his videos and like long form video essays is like my favorite type of content to consume. Uh, and I think that Super Eye Patch Wolf is probably the best person doing video essays on YouTube currently. Uh, I, I love his style of videos. I think he's great. He's such an effective storyteller and he makes people care about stuff that you might not otherwise care about. Like you click on a video and you go like, oh, I didn't, I had no knowledge of this thing, but now, oh, I'm really invested in it afterwards. Mm. It was that kind of thing to be like, I wish I could do that because I've wanted to do video essays for years and years and years. I love video essays. I wanted to make more of them. Um, but I thought like I needed to be in like a, a certain niche you know i need to do video essays about wrestling or i need to do video games about pokemon or i need to do video essays about DD or whatever yeah. you know any of the things that i'm into but his channel kind of opened up my eyes to being i could just make video essays about stuff that i like because i like a lot of things mm -hmm. I, I have an invested interest in a lot of things so i can just do video essays on a load of stuff and over the past like year, I've had the idea for the channel. I, the name just popped to me once and I was like, that's a stupid name. Let's go with it. Uh, and then I never really found the time to start doing it until a few months ago, I was having a conversation with my partner because we'd made uh, almost like a bucket list for 2023. We made things that we wanted to do in the year. And I was looking at it at about June time, about halfway through the year. And I was like, man, I really haven't like done much off this list like i just feel like i'm kind of like stagnant you know like i'm not i'm not achieving anything yeah. i'm not really getting any of my goals like this isn't great and then i said she said like right what would you do if you had time and money right now what would you do and i was off your list what would you do and i was like i'd make video essays that's what i do and she goes well do it then like you you have the capability like you know you can do it you just need the drive and you know you you need to be able to just sit down and focus and get it done because you have a lot of time that you spend doing not that you know and if you want to make it happen then make it happen mm -hmm. and it was that kind of conversation just be like you know what you're right let's just do it let's just make it happen 
And it was from then on, from about like July, August time, I started working on the first video and then it came out as of the time we're recording this, uh, it came out, you know, a few days ago. No, my first one. Yeah, I think it's, what is it now? What day is it today? My God, time. Monday. Uh, Yes, it's it's, uh, five days ago that it came out uh, as of Ah. the time we're recording it. Uh, So that was the first one that came out. And yeah, I'm underway with the second one. I, I love the process of making that first one. It felt so cathartic to me to to finally work on something that i've i've really wanted to work on for years mm. um yeah because i've got such a passion for for video game music in particular that i i just really wanted to just put that across to people to just be like everyone listen to it it's really good uh was basically the whole point of the video and i had i when i sat down to come up with different video ideas i'm like man i actually have quite a lot of ideas in my head for for different videos and it's all it's all coming very naturally like i think this is this is good. This, this could be something. And yeah, I, after seeing the response to the first video, I just, I was so motivated to just be like, right, well, let's go all in, let's keep going. Mm. Um, so yeah, so now, now the journey begins on that and I'm really excited to see where it goes. That's very, very cool. My friend. So you talk about that being excited to see how, where this is going to go and things like that. So when you do come up with concepts like that, this might be a bit inside baseball of the term, but like, when you want to do a project outside of your work with WrestleTalk, do you have to go to Ollie and just say, just letting you know, this is something I'm going to be doing in my spare time? Or is it sort of the thing where it's like, you're off the clock, you do what you like, sort of thing? It It's the latter. It is, you know, I'm I'm off the clock. I've, I've done my work where I work on my WrestleTalk projects, and now I'm going to work on my projects. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, like a lot of people who work for or are, are in the, the sphere of that have their own projects on the outside, like Tempest does his streaming. Luke has his uh, under consultation, which does uh, podcasts and all that stuff, talking about the, the show Games Master from, from years gone by. That's uh, so I get... well done, eh? Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and stuff with Cineworld as well. So there's like there's a bunch of stuff that all of us are working on outside of the the realms of what we do because we have a very strong passion for content creation and you mm. know the the content that we make and, and art and i think that permeates more than our job mm. uh and especially because our job a lot of the time we're, we're very much uh, focused on one thing that being wrestling a lot of the time and a lot of us have a lot of interest in so many other things that we don't really get to talk about that much so that kind of passion comes out in other topics that we that we like and, and get to talk about and that's where kind of pete repeat came from where i was like i want to talk about other things that aren't wrestling sometimes mm. um and then that, that was kind of my, my funnel for that did that come from a desire of like <laughs> wrestling's burning me out at the moment or like did that come from like a maybe not maybe losing your passion for wrestling wanting to talk about your passion for other things i hope that Uh, makes sense it 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 certainly did yeah i i wouldn't say it's necessarily losing a, a passion for wrestling necessarily i think there are times where i think especially like the the tribalism in certain sections of the wrestling fandom can be very tiring. Mm. Uh, and, you know, th- there'll be days where there'll be a particular video where there's some particularly negative comments or something like that. And I'm like, oh, I just, oh, this is really getting me down. But for the most part, it's fine. I'm still uh, perfectly okay with wrestling. And, you know, I enjoy watching it and talking about it and stuff like that. And I'm very fortunate to have my job. Um, you know, I, I love talking about wrestling and, and stuff like that. So it's not necessarily that aspect of it. It was just that I only talk about wrestling now when I have so much interest in a lot of other things. And arguably the other stuff I'm going to be talking about, I have more passion for than wrestling. Mm. Wrestling is not the number one passion for me. It's a very big passion, but I have other stuff that's more important to me. Uh, and that's where this other side of me is going to come from. Mm. That's very, very cool. So can you give us some teases of like, because as I said to you off camera, this will air in 2024, just because mm. we're, we're ahead in the content game sort of thing. That sounds yeah. like a brag, and I really don't mean it to be. I do apologize. <laughs> but could you give us some teasers of things people could expect for people? people? Sure. Sure, yeah. Um, I think the biggest things are... I I currently have four tattoos, and those tattoos are all about something that at one point in my life was a big part of it, one of my biggest passions. Uh, those four tattoos are stuff for Pokemon, for Harry Potter, for Avatar: The Last Airbender, and for Dungeons and Dragons. 
Those are those are the the four things. Did I repeat one? Harry Potter, Pokemon, D and D, Avatar: The Last Airbender. There you go. There. I would I would say those four things are pretty high on my list of things to talk about. Um, so you can probably expect something around those at some point, as well as some stuff that you absolutely will not think that I will talk about, but I will because I've got ideas for it. Mm. What is the topic that you're like? I'd love to cover that, but then what? But you're thinking like, nah, maybe that's going to be too hard or maybe people won't respond. Is there a, a niche topic that you're like, yeah. I'd love to cover that. Is that the right way? Uh, yeah, I, I think there's there's definitely one that I've got in my head that's not necessarily too niche or I don't think it will do well. I think it would do very well. I think it's going to be very hard to make. And I think it's going to be one that I would have to dedicate probably months to try and get that sorted um because you know at the minute i'm i'm just making stuff in my free time yeah, yeah. uh so I, I can't you know do as much work on it as i'd like to right now um but i think yeah that there's one there's one particular video that i've got on, on my list of ideas that i've got that i would love to do but i don't know when i'll be able to do it because it will take me a very long time to do it will take a lot of research and a lot of like time and dedication especially if i want to do it right I, I need to I need to really nail it, and that I think it would be really challenging. But I I mean I want to do it at some point. I just don't know when. That's very very cool, my friend. Something you talked about in the Muscle Man Malcolm interview that I watched for research recently is the fact that you sort of balance what wrestling you watch so you don't get burned out. So where is your current fandom with wrestling? Oh, I don't. I don't know if I have a particular fandom currently. I, wa I watch different products for different things. Uh, if I am in the mood for some really great in-ring wrestling, chances are I'm going to veer towards AEW. Mm -hmm. uh, simply, they have some of the best wrestlers in the world on their roster, and they are allowed to put on absolute bangers every single week. Chances are I'm going to veer towards AEW if I want some great wrestling. Um, sometimes because my, my biggest passion in life that encompasses m the vast majority of things I like is storytelling. I love <laughs> stories and granted a wrestling match can tell a great story for me. I love the soap opera drama of WWE storylines. And for me, that level of kind of drama and like interweaving characters and motivations. And you get like the big, like over the top dramatic lines that are delivered in promos and stuff like that. If I really want to hanker in for that, I might veer towards WWE, yeah. especially when W because for me, when WWE does that, well, there is nothing like it. Mm. It's great. And you can't beat it. Uh, when AEW does it well, granted it's incredible. And I love it. You know, like the hangman Omega story was absolutely perfection. And I absolutely adore it MJ for me Punk. though. M MGF Punk, MGF Adam Cole. Perfect. Love that stuff. Um, but for me, like the best storyline that I've seen in the last few years is the bloodline. And yeah. for me, like that is like the, the most, like that I get out of wrestling when I want that, that side of wrestling, that kind of narrative driven side of wrestling, the bloodline is the peak or at times can be the peak. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I watch wrestling for different things, um, rather than just like, I prefer one company over the other. It depends on my mood, really, what, no, what I, I want out of wrestling. I understand what you're saying. What wrestling are you... I always hate using the word required, but what wrestling are you sort of required, obligated, whatever word you want to use, what are you required to watch for wrestling at the moment? Um, technically, uh, nothing. Uh, okay. I'm, not required, I'm not required to watch anything. Uh, because I, I don't do any of the weekly reviews or the podcasts or anything that's, uh, you know, you have to watch the show to review it kind of thing. Um, if I'm on like a live reaction stream, obviously I will be watching the show as I'm reacting. Uh, or if I'm doing like a review or a podcast the following day or something, I will, if I'm covering for someone or whatever, obviously I will be watching the shows for that. I'm not required to watch any wrestling to keep up to date with my job, mm. but I like to watch it anyway because I like to be in the loop of what's happening. And even at the very least, if I can't, if I don't have the time to sit down and watch a show i will at least catch up with the highlights i'll check what's been going on and check out clips and stuff like that to make sure i'm still in the loop with everything mm. i understand what you're saying completely there so i want to talk to you before we get into the monday night wars which was one of my favorite series on part time i'm not gonna lie i want to ask you about bringing new presenters in like sullivan we've seen him do some more work on uh 
parts of unknown, like survival series and things like that. We've seen Sati Niangi take over your job of the uh, uh, SmackDown review uh, and things like that. So how do you feel like bringing in new presenters has helped the blood of WrestleTalk and things like that? Um, hugely. I, I love oh, Layton, working with well. new people. And Dan Layton. We love Dan Layton. Uh, I love working with new people. It's such a fresh coat of paint on WrestleTalk and Parts of Unknown. Parts of Unknown especially. Mm. Um, Wrestle Talk, we kind of have our presenters, and it's hard to just bring in someone new. Uh, partly because a lot of the fans are conditioned to expect us, so when they see something different, it's a bit jarring. But also because wrestling news is kind of like a niche within a niche. You can enjoy yeah. wrestling, but don't have to enjoy wrestling news, kind of thing, you know. So mm-hmm. getting someone who is passionate enough about wrestling news to then kind of like you know do do content on it and stuff like that is is unique. Uh, and I'm really glad we managed to find Sat who could do that. Um, but bringing in more people has been so refreshing for like just us in the office to have more people around because obviously we have people over on like No Rolls Bard as well. And we have a bunch of new like guests that come in for that and all that stuff. So there's so many people that are coming in and out these days. It's so great to make so many connections with so many people and so many different voices to have around and there's more guests that we've got lined up like we have filmed some more episodes of no holds board like our wrestling board game show on parts of unknown mm-hmm. we've filmed some more episodes of that and some of the guests that we've got on for those shows i'm so glad we got them in because we've wanted to, to have these guests for mm-hmm. months and we finally made it happen which i'm really i'm really happy with and you know getting to have more not just like more of the same but having like a diverse cast you know getting in more people who are you know different to us because we're all straight white bald men you know and and getting in different people like that is is crucial i think and i'm really glad we've been able to make it happen that's very very cool uh what about tempest finally coming over from canada how did that i did a full podcast with him when he first moved over about his experience and stuff cheap plug check that out if you haven't already but um how did that feel to finally get him over to the uk and to do things with Tempest. It was so great um, because Tempest and I, we had started kind of his main integration into like being more on the screen and stuff like that was through uh, doing the NXT review podcast with me. Um, we were kind of like the duo who st- who started like his kind of more on screen um, side of, of content. And he was brought in as the fact checker on Quizlemania as well, uh, but the NXT reviews was kind of like his uh, more wrestle talk side integration. Uh, so we would always kind of stay around and and chat post shows and stuff like that. And uh, I remember distinctly the one time we did a show and we stuck around and we were just talking afterwards, and he just went, "Pete." I'm coming. <laughs> He's coming to the UK. And, uh, and I lost my mind a little bit. And it was great. And we had it all planned out. And he was just figuring out some details. And we wanted to make it happen so he could come over for Forbidden Door, specifically for the first Forbidden Door pay-per-view. Because uh, we thought that would be a really cool reveal to get him on the stream for that. So yeah, uh, it was so great to have him here. Because uh, he'd, been, he'd been a close friend of mine for a while, uh, just through doing work stuff and all that. Um, but getting to actually meet him in person and have his level of creativity around in the office, being able to bounce ideas off of him, him being the catalyst for great shows like No Holds Board and Survival Series and stuff like that is is so great. And his like his level of dedication and creativity just kind of infected everything else that we were doing. And it was great. He's, he's such a great person to have around. So cool. What about... And then... I'm trying to say we're here. So what is obviously Luke Owen was established before you were. Is there something you've learned from Luke as you've grown as a presenter? And then how did the Monday Night Wars come about? So I mean I've learned uh most things from Luke, I wanna say. Um Luke is great and another another handyman as well, a guy who can do anything and do it well. Uh, cause he's a wonderful person. Uh, and the way the Monday night wars came about was Luke and I had spoken for ages about doing a, my GM GM mode type series. Uh, I'm, I was massively inspired by battle of the brands that, uh, woods and breeze did on up, up, down, down. Mm-hmm. 
that was one of my favorite series when they did their original battle, battle of the brands uh series so i was like man i really wish i could do that because i played uh gm mode back in the day on smackdown versus raw 2006 like that was that was one of my games so i was like okay I... was mine, by the way oh nice nice yeah also great um so I was like, man, I really want to just do that for a, a stream. I think that'd be really fun. I think we can make like a show out of it. And me and Luke had been talking for ages about like, yeah, we should really make this a show. We should do that. And then 2K announced that in 2K22, they were going to be bringing back my GM mode. And we were like, right, that's the time. We're going to do it. Um, so then, yeah, we reached out to 2K and we were like, here's what we want to do. Here's a show that we want to make uh how do you feel about that and luckily they said sounds great uh so then yeah we got we managed to get 2k to sponsor the show and then we got to make the show and we kind of wanted we did it exactly how we wanted to do it and it was great and we got costumes and it was really silly uh it was exactly what i wanted and i'm so happy it it, it's so fun because it's just both of us being an absolute idiot the whole time Mm. um and yeah it's so much fun I i love monday night war it's so great how does it feel when the rivalries won't uh, rivalries won't bro, yeah. oh. rivalries won't row though? Rivalries won't row. It's it's the worst feeling because it's just luck. And I, I tell you what, there's been a lot of comments saying like, if you do this, this, and this, it guaranteed works every time. And I tell you, you're all wrong because it doesn't. The rivalries don't row every time. All right, they just don't. Mm. <laughs> uh, I love that show. That was a very fast <laughs> question, and I do apologise. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, man. I just I love the Monday Night Wars so much. I'm not. Really I'm right. glad. That I'm was glad. a, it's a great show. I love making I, it. I've told people this off camera, but I'm going to tell you this on camera. I went through a depression period last year, just to due to content burnout and stuff. And Monday mm-hmm. Night Wars really helped me. I'm not going to lie. No, amazing. I'm so glad. I, I'm I, I'm glad we can help in any way we can. I love making Monday Night War, and I'm glad people like it. That's very very cool. I brought up depression. And something we talked about was imposter syndrome last time. So now that you've more settled into wrestle talk and things like that, and you're more established, where would you say your imposter syndrome is currently? I hope that's worded correctly. It's um, it's better. I will say it's better. Um, I think, I think one of my. Oof, Blessing? Curse. Which one is it? I don't know. It could be both. One of the things is I'm very I'm very critical of myself, um, but I think I'm also very realistic with my criticism. Mm. So I know, I'm, I'm very honest with myself, when something is bad, I know it's bad. And when something is good, I know it's good. And for me, I think I have a pretty good balance of telling myself and realizing when I've done something well and when I've done something poorly. So for me, over time, being able to see things I've done well and for example, stuff like Monday Night War has been such a great like cure for that because people responded well to it. People were watching it and people wanted to come specifically for me and Luke. Whereas like a lot of the time people would come to watch the shows that I'm on because the brand is well known mm. or, you know, the, the, the format is well known. Like it's a Wrestle Talk podcast or a Wrestle Talk news episode or whatever it may be. This was something that me and Luke had created and people were coming because of me and Luke you know and that is that's something that that it's it's sounds very egotistical and and you know narcissistic but you people mean, coming to you know pe- people coming to watch something that you make because you made it is great and even since then just like hanging out with so many funny people Sullivan Bo Brown is one of the funniest people I've ever met and he has so many funny friends that he always brings in to do projects with him. So we get to hang out with just a bunch of comedians and really funny people all the time. And I think genuinely being around those people has helped me be more funny. Mm-hmm. So that when it comes to like being on camera, I feel like I'm not out of place that much anymore. I feel like I'm actually providing something for the content. If I'm on a show like a No Holds Board, for example, when I'm surrounded by people and we're all playing a board game, I think I actually provide some sort of value. Whereas before, when my imposter syndrome was quite bad, I would have thought that like, oh, we're here because we need Pete's here because we need to fill numbers. Mm. Whereas now it feels like we want Pete on the show because I think he's actually going to be good for it, you know. Uh, and that is that's it's, it only comes with time and practice and dedication and being realistic with yourself. And I think I've done that quite well. Thank God. Do you remember the moment that you were like, okay, 
I belong in WrestleTalk now, and this is where I belong. Oof. Um, no, there wasn't. I don't think there was a particular moment because it it kind of ebbs and flows. It comes and goes at times. There was the first time I remember that I the, the first time I think I've spoken about this maybe on a podcast a long long time ago. Um, karaoke. There was a moment. Uh, no, not karaoke. It was a different time. Sorry, uh, though, that is, though, though, though that is one. Um, but uh, there was a moment not long after I joined. I think it might have been a couple of months after I first joined and moved down to London and started doing this full time, where I was doing a video. I think it might have been a news episode. And Ollie was watching it, uh, just like give feedback on it. And he watched it and I did a, a very stupid joke and he laughed and he said, that was really good. And that little moment there, I was like, my God, I can do this job. You know, I'm not, I'm not a complete failure uh, mm. at this thing. That was one of the moments where I was like, okay, I think I'm, I'm getting to grips with this now. I understand what's happening and all that stuff. And that was just a fleeting moment at the time, but that has now become, I think I'm, I'm, my self-confidence has grown massively over the years. And now I think that I am quite good at my job, shockingly. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I, it's nice to, to see that people like what I do more often than not now. There's naysayers all the time, you know, it's the internet, but I think more often than not, there's more positive feedback than negative on stuff I do, which is, which is great. Love to see there's so many segues I could go with that. And I really appreciate all the content. I'm not going to lie. But you brought up the naysayers and negative comments. So when mm -hmm. you do see a negative comment on a Monday Night Wars, a news video, whatever, how do you deal with that sort of thing now? And how would you have dealt with it in the past, maybe? <laughs> uh, I would that have dealt with well it like a poorly. Question, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're going we're gonna to get deep here today. Okay. Um, so I would have dealt with it very poorly in the past. Uh, it's very easy to get bogged down with negativity on the internet. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to see that one negative comment and it affect the rest of your day or week or whatever it may be. Uh, and for me, it is literally just exposure to negativity that has weathered me against it. It is me growing a thicker skin because of negativity. And I learn more often than not, don't check the comments. Just don't. Especially when it's something that I know is going to be a divisive topic. If it's something that I'm covering in the news that I know people are going to be upset about, or it's going to be, you know, and I, I did, you know, a, a SmackDown review and I said an unpopular opinion or something like that, you know, where I've said like, I didn't really get a lot out of this segment, but other people seem to really like it. You know, if I say something like that, I'm not going to check the comments because I know everyone's going to be really upset because I, I didn't like something they liked or I liked something that I shouldn't have liked or whatever. Um, so it's a bit of self-control of not seeing it in the first place. And also when you do see it, I really try to compartmentalize that and kind of put it to one side because I'm like, why do I care about this person's opinion? Really? You know, I, I don't, there's i I'm trying to think of the wording of the phrase. There's a certain phrase that I always try and think of, and I can't exactly remember the wording of it right now, but it's something don't like ask for the opinion of those you wouldn't don't value the opinion of those you wouldn't ask the opinion of essentially it's, it's something like that yeah you don't 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 value someone's opinion who you wouldn't ask feedback from you know like right. i just you know just like if, if they have their opinion cool great you have your opinion i have my opinion you have yours doesn't matter we both hold the same weight doesn't matter move on i know what i think you know what you think fine um yeah like obviously it's hard when you like when you pour your heart into something and people are like well this sucks like you know that can obviously be a little bit rough and that's very hard to deal with but if someone is like, I'm really upset with your opinion, it's like, okay, cool. I, Opinions I don't... are like, but yeah. everyone's got them. <laughs> everyone's got one. Uh, so there's a lot of like, yeah, there's a lot of that now of just being like, I don't really care if people are going to be upset. If it's upset with something that I've legitimately done and all that stuff, you know, that's fine. If, if I've genuinely made a mistake or, you know, I, I've misreported something or, you know, whatever it may be totally fine but if people are upset with my opinion i'll be like mm. i don't care what you have to say because it's my opinion and i'm allowed to have it so there you go yeah i see what you're saying completely there so before we do the segment that i do not believe i was the meeting last time i had you on which is generic so. questions and yep. the wrap-up question before we do that i want to know put things out into the universe what's on your 
bucket list for 2024 as this goes out, whether it be for Pete Repeat, whether it be for WrestleTalk? Um, so I've got quite a few things on my bucket list for 2024. Um one there's a bit of traveling that i want to do completely separate to content wise but just in in life um a little bit of traveling i i want to do at least one hot holiday next year um did one this year and it was great uh i'd love to do another one next year because i think it really helped me like recharge and i needed that last year uh this year sorry so hopefully next year i can do another one that would be great um aside from that though content wise um, I have a lot of video ideas for Pete Reapy in particular, which I would very much like to do. I want to try and get, as we're recording this, you'll know whether I've done it or not, because this video is going to come out next year. But Sorry. my plan currently, as of the time of recording, is I want to try and release another video in November, ideally another video in December, but I'm not holding myself to that. Um, maybe January, but then beyond that, I'm not 100% sure when my next video is going to be. I have various ideas. I don't know which one, which path I'm going to go down yet. I don't know which idea I'm going to take yet. Uh, but I'd like to get another, you know, four or five videos out next year if I can. That would be great. Um, and in terms of, like, wrestle talk and stuff like that, it's just about keeping to keeping growing, uh, keeping coming up with new series ideas, debuting those series, seeing what sticks, and just keeping course and making sure that I can make everything the best that I can make it. You know, we're in, as, again, as of the time of recording, we've debuted a couple I'm new so shows sorry. recently. Uh, yeah. You don't have to apologize. It's totally okay. Uh, we've debuted a, a couple new shows recently. Like we did tables, lists and chairs on wrestle talk, which I think is really fun. Uh, really fun. Like new take on list formats of having three people share their list at the same time and talking about it. I think that's really cool and, and fresh and, I think it's a really fun show. And also like on, on Parts of Unknown, we brought back uh, Fantasy Booking Warfare, which I think is a great show. It's really well done this time. Our panel of judges is so cool because we managed to get Michael Oku and Nina Samuels on it and it's really cool. So, um, cool. so, so like, yeah, having, having all this new stuff come in as well as just like refining a lot of the old stuff we've got, that's basically what the plan is for, for 2024. Continue debuting cool new shows and tweaking what we've already got to make it even better. That's very, very cool, my friend. So as we look at wrapping this up, Pete, I alluded this to you in DMs and things like that. We are going to mm. do a segment that I call Generic Questions. Those of you that have seen my interviews before, I know as far as my guests, their favourite wrestling match, favourite overall wrestling pay-per-view, such as Double or Nothing 2019, favourite uh, wrestlers entrance music, favourite tag team, and favourite wrestler. Basically questions. I think Pete might be asked on social media quite regularly. So now he'll have a place to be like, I've answered this. Please go watch this. So what's your mm -hmm. favorite match? My favorite match of all time, currently, mm -hmm. this might change. Currently, my favorite match of all time is DIY versus The Revival from NXT TakeOver Toronto. Two out of three falls match. Love that match with all my heart. It's like where I was most excited for wrestling, almost, not quite, but almost the most excited for wrestling. And that match, op well, th those two teams in particular and American Alpha opened my eyes to tag team wrestling and what it could be. And that to me was the culmination of my journey to understand tag team wrestling. And that match is damn near perfect. It's very, very cool. What about your favorite overall pay-per-view card? My favorite overall pay-per-view is NXT TakeOver New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans, which has Gargano versus Champer on it when Gargano wins his job back. It has the North American title ladder match, which is a absolutely astonishingly great match. Um, it has Roderick Strong joining uh, the Undisputed Era. Uh, it has Shayna Baszler being a badass on that show. I think she, like, she put, they, puts her shoulder back that's exactly the spot. Yeah, she pretended to like dislocate her shoulder and pop it back in and stuff like that. It was just an awesome with show. The I, with the ring post as well. It was such an awesome show from top to bottom. Like that is such a, a perfectly a perfect length for a show and perfect variety on it. Because you had like the ladder high spots, you had the blood feud to go in, you had women being badasses, like the more like fighting style of that stuff. There's just so much variety on the show and it's perfect. Love that love that show. What about your favorite entrance music? Favorite entrance music? You might notice a theme here. 
uh, considering I've mentioned TakeOver Toronto and TakeOver New Orleans, I might have a certain bias towards NXT here. But my favorite entrance music of all time is the Undisputed Era's entrance music. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, so good. It's uh, so good. Shock, shock the system and all that, because god damn like it's really close for me between uh undisputed era and adam cole's aew entrance music because both of them are phenomenal but i think i've I've just got to pit undisputed eras here it holds such a place in my heart particular in particular that Mm -hmm. i don't think i can pick against it it's so good that's very very cool i have a feeling where we're going with tag teams but who is your favorite tag team ftr is yeah. my favorite tag team yeah so. uh they are wonderful they're great again they're part of the reason why i discovered tag team wrestling and what it meant and what it could be you know r- rather than just it's singles wrestling but with four people uh it completely changed my perspective on what storytelling and wrestling could be and stuff like that it's it's awesome and i love it and then finally awesome that. Pete, they're great that's a very very cool and then finally, Pete, as we wrap this up, obviously I want to say thank you for a great conversation. Thank you for returning to Tom Tom Trubbish and coming back of course, on the thank show. You me. Uh, uh, but who is your favorite wrestler of all time? Favorite wrestler of all time? I don't think I can say otherwise. I think it has to be Brian Danielson. Um, for all aspects of his career, when he was the Miz's rookie into the yes movement into his heel run on the cash in into his rise into mania 30 into his retirement into his general manager stuff into aew into everything that he's done he has been amazing and he's never not been amazing he is a master of in-ring uh, technical wrestling but also in-ring psychology and the ability to tell a story within the bounds of one match is i think unparalleled he is a master and he's my favorite wrestler it's very very cool my friend and a very good answer because he's also my favorite wonderful so as we wrap this up the question i now end this show on is i believe as content creators youtubers podcasters anyone with social media, we're all sort of going to live forever in some sort of very strange way if you think about the world. So what is one piece of content you're like, I'd like to be remembered Mm. for that. And then what is one that you're like, yuck, please don't remember me for that. Um, (laughs) I'd like to not be remembered for uh, the Ass Man music video that I had to make. That's gross and I hate it. Um, (laughs) Please stop playing it um but a piece of content that i would really like people to remember before is my first peat repeat video it Mm -hmm. is me distilled down to just over half an hour it's what i care about it's the way i like to consume my content it is everything i want it to be uh that is in and of itself that that is me as a piece of content and that i think is very emblematic of everything that i stand for so that would be that would be the very very cool so as we wrap this up pete do me a favor promote yourself please where can the good people find you your work etc uh so you can find me on uh my my own youtube channel of youtube.com slash pete repeat yt i believe is the url pete repeat on youtube i do video essays about stuff stuff that i like stuff that i don't like stuff stuff that interests me um i also stream on twitch twitch.tv slash pete quinnell i'm on twitter x instagram uh book me on cameo all of those links are just pete quinnell um so yeah i think it's everything and of course you can find me on wrestle talk parts of unknown wrestle podcast etc um so yeah that's me it's very very cool obviously again i want to say thank you to pete for coming back onto the show uh make sure you guys check this out like, share, and subscribe on YouTube if you like this. Uh, follow me on Twitter or X at Tom to Pro, and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye now.